begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for the, the 90 years of grace that you've shown to, to June as we uh, celebrate uh, this, this wonderful gift. Uh, we are uh, thankful, especially for what your son has done for her and for all of us, uh, that by his, his life, death, and resurrection, we have been ransomed from sin, death, uh, and the power of the devil. And we have the hope of not just celebrating 90 years, but eternal life with you. And we ask you to give us a full measure of your Holy Spirit this morning as we study your word. Uh, give us wisdom through Ecclesiastes and comfort in Hebrews uh, and uh, allow us to go out into this world with confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning was the second Sunday uh, or the first Sunday after Trinity. I was starting this long green season uh, where the color green is there uh, because the color green is a, uh, the color uh, green is a color of growth. Uh, and so after the first half of the church year, which starts in Advent, and Christmas and uh, going through Epiphany, Lent, Easter, all of that is sometimes called the time of Christ. We're focusing so much on the life of Christ and kind of following through it a little bit chronologically from Christmas all the way through Ascension and Pentecost. Uh, during the green season, this Trinity season, is sometimes called the time of the church. So now we're talking about us being grafted into Christ uh, as branches in the vine. Uh, and uh, we have... Okay, go. Uh, and we have uh, a, a full and fruitful life uh, of faith united to the Holy Trinity. Uh, and so now in this time, there's, there's more of the uh, parables of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. We're thinking a little less of going through the life of Jesus chronologically, more about his teachings, his miracles, uh, and the sacraments, and things that... Uh, you know, are that point uh, where the branch is connected to the vine. And we're getting what we need from him so that we uh, can love other people, uh, which is what we heard from uh, John this morning, uh, that we love because he first loved us. So uh, you can think about the whole church here, kind of summarized by that passage from John. We love because he first loved us. First half of the church year, it's all about what Christ has done for us. And the second half of the church here is what Christ is doing through us uh, as we live uh, for other people. So um, the green season starting uh, today. Any questions or comments about this morning's service? While it's fresh in mind, anything you wanted to ask about um, before you get to past noon and to completely forget what you heard uh, this morning at all? Um, <laughs> which usually happens to me. Don't ask me what I preached about when it's three o'clock in the afternoon. I only answer a bit. Hopefully Jesus, <laughs> but I don't remember. Okay. Um, some beautiful hymns, some beautiful music. And I love that uh, rich man and, and poor Lazarus uh, account. There's a little bit of debate as to if this is a parable or something that happened. Uh, the reason there's some debate is because, like every other parable, there's no proper name. You know, there was a farmer, or there was a king, or there was a man, or, you know, a man went out to sow his seed. Um, here you have Lazarus, actually named. So there's some people who say, well, that sets it apart from the rest of the parables. Maybe this is about a real man named Lazarus. Um, I think we can leave it an unanswered question. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But what's really remarkable uh, at the end of the reading this morning is that not even if, if a man, even if a man is raised from the dead, if they're not going to listen to the word, not going to listen to Moses and the prophet. They won't believe even if the man is raised from the dead. And then there's a Lazarus who was raised from the dead. And what did people do? They started to plot to kill Jesus. They wouldn't, they knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and still refused to believe him 
In fact, then in John chapter 11, uh, that's when they say, okay, we need to put together a plot. We need to kill this man. Um, I, I love that. Looking at John 11 and the end of what we heard this morning about the rich man and poor Lazarus. Even if a man is raised from the dead, if they're not going to believe the word of God, miracles aren't going to help. And then a real man named Lazarus is really raised from the dead. And the leaders of the people said, we will not put our faith in Jesus. Instead, we're going to try to kill him. Exactly like Jesus said this morning. Okay. If there's nothing else about this morning that, that came to mind. Yeah. About where he can see into heaven and they're talking back and forth. Because um, it seems that I remember, I don't know, I was taught at one time that once you're in heaven, you don't see any bad things anymore on earth or whatever. And I would think them being able to see the, see, is it just Abraham that saw into heaven or into hell or was it Lazarus too? I mean, you can see it, but there's a chasm of no crossing. Yeah. So that, that was interesting. I mean, I've heard it before. But still, it's something we're talking about because no crying, no pain, no anything in heaven. But then we see those in despair. Yeah. So there's the strong argument uh, against it being something that happened and that it being a parable. OK. Um, that it, it doesn't seem like we would be able to see into hell. But there's there's nothing in scripture that's that precise that says. It says no more crying or mourning or pain, but it never says that we have no idea what's going on on earth or in hell. Um, God knows, uh, and he's in his perfect justice and love. Uh, he's able to have that without the, the sorrow that we would experience right now. Like to, to think about hell right now is awful for us. Would we be at a, be so like God that we would be able to fully understand what we can't fully understand right now? And that, uh, and to be completely okay with his perfect justice, that yes, those people are getting what they deserve. And that, like right now, if I know that someone uh, who robbed Casey's uh, is sitting in jail, a jail cell, uh, like that doesn't hurt me right now. You, you don't rob, don't rob Casey's and you won't be in jail. You know, that's that's fair. Will we be at such a level of understanding God's justice? That to know that there's people in hell is not going to cause us any pain. And even knowing that we know some of those people. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so I, I lean more towards, this is a parable. Uh, but I don't think there's enough clear in scripture to say that the, we will have, we will not be able to see like Abraham sees here. You know, what we do have in scripture is Abraham talking to someone in hell? Uh, whether it's parable or not, that's something we have to kind of wrestle with. And I think the way to wrestle with it is God's justice is good. And I'm okay with a certain level of justice. You know, someone robs the bank or robs Casey's. Uh, it doesn't hurt me at all to find out he's in jail. He should, he should be in jail. Um, the people who are in hell are not receiving undue punishment. It's proper that they're there. That's a hard one for us to get over right now because we know some of those people. You know? Um, yeah. But it's it's such an interesting account. The rich man and poor Lazarus. But in the same way as the robber Excuse me. Same way as the robber chose to rob Casey's, those people in hell also made the choice to reject the Lord. Is that right? Those who are in hell are in hell because they did not want 
the gift of, of grace uh, and said no to it. Um, but even there, it's we have to tread lightly. Uh, there are things that God has said and, and hasn't fully said. And um, what does that mean about those who didn't have mental? I mean, didn't have the mental capability to say yes or no. Um, with those who are damned, it's their fault. With those who are saved, it's God gets the credit. And if we try to explain any more, then we get into like double predestination. Uh, or we have to uh, put too much emphasis on your choice, your decision uh, to uh, follow God and give your life uh, over to Jesus. This is one of those uh, places where as Lutherans, we're fine with the tension and we want to just leave it alone. We don't want to explain away how it can be that those who are damned are damned because of everything that we've done. And those who are saved are saved because of everything that Christ did for the whole world. Um, you leave that tension. And it spurs us on to say to our, our friend, you know what, there's a class on Wednesday nights uh, this fall. Um, it's a new member class, and we'd love for you. We'd love for you to join us in the peace that we have, uh, in knowing uh, that uh, in baptism we're uh, adopted in God's family, uh, in the absolution we're forgiven of all of our sins. Uh, that Christ, who died, He died for all of our sins. Yes, even that one uh, that you're ashamed of. Um, this tension of why are some saved and others are are not. We leave it there. And we're spurred on by it you know, to say to others, hey, Jesus loves you. And I know of a place uh, where it's all about uh, Jesus loving. And the gifts that he won on the cross uh, are, are delivered in scripture and in sacrament, Sunday after Sunday. I want you here. I can't explain some stuff. Uh, and every time I explain what I can't explain, I become a heretic. <laughs> But this, it's a tough tension. Uh, why is the rich man in hell and I'm so sure that I'm not going to be? And I'm like, I would love to. I, I mean, I'm not, purple's not my favorite color maybe to wear, um, but living in luxury every day? Oh, that'd be, I would love that. I mean, I've got the same sinful nature as the rich man does. <clears throat> why him, not me? Why, I leave that tension and spurs us on to speak to those who don't know. Okay. Uh, in our class, at, uh, this booklet that we have will be on page 86. Uh, should, would have worked out well if we were finishing up, we'd get to page 90. Uh, that would have been perfect. <laughs> we're two years, two years behind. Um, we're 86. Um, but we've been going through the Sunday morning church service uh, and how we make use of the word of God in each part of the service so that we can better appreciate uh, the seeds that are scattered all throughout that Sunday morning service. Uh, and we can be fruitful uh, as we're receiving this gift. Uh, here is the last prayer of the church service, uh, which is called sometimes called a vocational prayer, which means, you know, God's calling for us to love other people. Uh, it's a post-communion prayer. Uh, we pray it after we uh, sing uh, the Song of Simeon, uh, that Nook de Minas song, uh, and right before we have the final blessing. So some thoughts about that prayer. Uh, first from Hebrews 13. And now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, in connection with his blood, which established the eternal testament, may he equip you with every good thing to do his will, as he works in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The heart loves, but who, why, and how? The heart loves those who are lovable. The heart loves because it has been earned. The heart loves with condition, with limitation, with caution. It has been burned before, after all. The heart is made new in the liturgy. 
The post-communion collect is a vocational prayer. We who have been loved are called to love, and we are sent out with a heart that beats in rhythm with Christ to love our neighbor as we have been loved. So this is one of the uh, prayers that we use at the end of the service. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift, with this salutary gift. You might remember that word. Um, our, our poetry has uh, gone downhill uh, in English over time. Salutary is a nice word to, to sort of bring back. But saving gift, uh, we pray through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one, for one another. So these two things, strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. Faith and love. And that is the simplicity of our lives. The new heart keeps it that simple. It beats in rhythm with Christ. It beats with the blood it just drank. It loves as it has been loved. It does not love only the lovable, but lovable eyes is the unlovable. This is the kind of love it has received. It was not loved first by Jesus because it is lovable. So it's not a, God so loved the world because all, all of you guys are so nice, fine, gentle. And he looked down us and said, oh, they're so great. I love them. Look how good they are. No, he loves a world of sinners, right? While we were still sinners. Uh, Christ died for us. So this is the kind of love uh, that the heart has received. It was not loved first by Jesus because it is lovable. No. The love of Jesus made the new heart, made the heart new, made it lovable. And the heart then goes out to love, to be bread for the hungry, to be grace for the guilty, to be the shoulder to cry on for the sorrowful, to love as it has been loved. The old heart wants to make it complicated like a lawyer. In the complicated mess of legal jar jargon, it will find every loophole for why it does not have to love that person, why it does not have to love at this time, why it does not have to love that much. Jesus demolishes the little lawyer we are born as and sets us free with a new heart to love without condition. So as we have been loved, we're praying uh, that uh by receiving the gift of God's grace on Sunday morning, that would increase our love for one another. And so that we would love the same way we have that love. Not looking at someone and saying, they did me a good turn, okay, I guess I'll be nice to them. But saying, this person attacked me, they've acted as my enemy. Ah, that means I get to love. You know? Uh, because that's the way that we have been loved. And that's the way that Jesus loves. So this last prayer uh, after communion is such a beautiful one. And it's so easy for us in our sinful nature, me especially as a pastor, you know, I, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the end of my uh, work week, you know, I only work for one day and it's only in the morning. Uh, and here we are, it's, it's like Friday for me. I'm getting to the end of, of the week and ready to clock out and, you know, I made it through. I didn't say any heresy during the sermon. Um, but here we go, almost the weekend. Uh, it's very easy for me to not think about that last prayer and just go through the motions. Uh, and then we're thinking about the coffee downstairs and the other things to do. Um, treasure that prayer. It's the reading from First John that we had this morning. We love because he first loved us. You know, we pray in that manner uh, every Sunday at the end of, of the day so that we're sent out. Uh, to, to go in love. Um, it's a beautiful prayer. Um, what I'd like to do, we've got, we've got six minutes. We get to, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter eight. Uh, Ecclesiastes uh, is such a book of the Bible for our time. Uh, and so uh, overlooked and forgotten. Um, I've, I've, I'm going to keep saying it. It takes you about 40 minutes to read through the whole thing. You've got enough time every week to spend time in the Ecclesiastes every week, and you'll benefit from it every week. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Um, life seems pointless sometimes. 
what do this chapter and this post-communion collect, this prayer we've been talking about, what do they say to us when it seems like life is pointless? Um, it seems like life is pointless very, very often. What are we doing? Why am I doing this? What, what's the point? Ecclesiastes is really helpful if you feel absolutely no direction in life. And this last prayer of the church service is an Ecclesiastes sort of prayer. Um, there's motivation here. I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 8. How is this helpful if you think that life is pointless? I'm going to begin at verse 2. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there, there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon it. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? No man has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the day of his death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over those others to his own hurt. Then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve, and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seen sleep day or night. Then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Ecclesiastes is a remarkable book because we often feel like life is pointless, it is meaningless, and younger generations even more so than older generations, um, the, the despair over what's the, the point of all of it. And then Ecclesiastes comes along and he says, vapor, meaningless, everything's a breath. He's almost agreeing with atheists who say there's no point to any of it. Righteous people are treated like the wicked. Wicked people are treated like they're righteous. It seems like nothing's fair. We in the Christian church get to tie Ecclesiastes to the cross of Christ. And we see the righteous one treated like a wicked one. And therefore we see God's love. So that we are motivated not to make this world perfect because it's going to continue to look kind of meaningless and pointless and things are going to be unfair, which means we don't have to be hampered by it or depressed by it, okay? We know what kind of world this is. The righteous are treated terribly. The most holy one of God came down and did nothing wrong and was crucified. We should expect that this world is going to be topsy-turvy, all messed up. 
So enjoy your food when you get it. Enjoy your drink. Enjoy your work. Get after it. Because you know that Christ has conquered all of the problems. And so Ecclesiastes, tied to the cross of Christ, means that, okay, life does seem pointless a whole lot. But I know the one who conquered it. And he came to me and he said, take eat my body. Take drink, my blood poured out for you. And now I get to go and take up my work with the proper expectation. That this is not heaven. This is a broken world. Of course, everything under the sun is falling apart. God said so. You know, we sinned and God gave a curse. Life is going to be tough. Okay? Um, don't expect this to be heaven or to be paradise. But rejoice that Jesus Christ conquered it all. And he loves you. And you go out loved by him. And therefore, you can be a person of hope, which is what Hebrews 11 and 12 is all about. You know, uh, Hebrews 11, all those people who lived by faith. They're not trying to make the world paradise. Because if you try to make the world paradise, you usually have to make some terrible uh, concessions. You know, People who have tried to make a Christian utopia out of uh, a given country throughout the, the history of the world have done some pretty evil, wicked things. Um, because you're up against it. You're, it's not going to be paradise. Expect that. Expect that you're in the desert. Expect that Jesus was right when he said you're going to have trouble in the world. But then take heart. Why? Because I have, I have overcome it. So Ecclesiastes, while it seems like it's saying to uh, amen to everything that, you know, uh, the atheists might say, like, there's no point in any. Yeah, it's a lot of meaningless stuff. Um, but we tie that to the cross of Christ. And we say, yes, he has conquered the world. And now I can go out and be light in the world, just like that. And I'll suffer, of course. I'll, I'll meet opposition, of course. What do you expect? This is the devil's kingdom. Uh, so it's a good motivating sort of thing. Um, but it's a, it's a tough lesson for us to learn. Because we expect that if I do good, then I'll be dressed in purple and fine linen and live in luxury every day. If I do good and we vote the right way, then uh, this will be paradise and a shining a city on the hill, and everything will be nice again. Well, this is the devil's kingdom, so get to work. Be loved by God and go out uh, to, to love the way that, that he has loved. Um, all right, that's really quick. We'll stop there. Thoughts yeah. or questions? Good, happy day. Um to celebrate. I'm glad we have you here. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful week.